This program contains adult content. What is there a God? A big atheist. Really? What am I, an idiot? Come on. That yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else. But it's not true. It looks like far left lunacy. I don't believe that it's true that religion is moral or ethical. You don't need to follow anybody! It's not human intelligence! If someone doesn't value logical consistency, what logical argument are you going to give them that will demonstrate that they should? Hello and welcome to the Godless Revolution. Today is Wednesday, October 6th. This is episode 353. My name is Dan Ellis, and I'm joined by two awesome co-hosts, Mr. Ryan Duffy. Yes, I am present this week. <laughs> and Mr. Taylor Grin. Uh, 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 hi, hi, hi. Hi. <laughs> so I'm still, uh, I'm, I told you guys before we started recording, uh, I should let the audience know. I'm, t- I'm not on my A game today. I'm really, really tired. But that's fine. We're going to roll it. It'll be great. This is going to be an awesome show. I'm excited about it. And I'm still kind of riding a high from last week's show. <laughs> last week's show was so cool. Yeah. Ho- hopefully yeah. I don't bring it down. <laughs> <laughs> Just a bit. No, that was that was awesome. Uh, once again, I'd yeah. like to thank Andrew for coming on the show. That was that was fun. Yeah. We had some good I've, feedback. I've received some ridiculously good feedback. Well, let's hear show. all about it. What What's new with you guys? Let's start with you, Taylor. What have you heard? Oh man, um, I had I had one of my buddies, um, a different James, not our not our Patreon supporter James, but the James that I um, was in the military with. Actually, he and I were in the same unit. Um, he reached out to me and he was like, "I could just listen to you and Andrew talk for hours." Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he he really enjoyed that show. Um, I've had a few other people, my friend Bridget, uh, you know, Ted, one of our Patreon supporters. A lot of good feedback. A lot of people enjoyed that. I want to do everything that we can to find good reasons that are worth his time to bring him back on the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, can the know, reason as, be as because often it's as Friday? <laughs> like it's Friday. I mean, it's a good reason to come on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if it was, if it wasn't so hard to edit, yeah, I'd just be like, all right, cool. This is going to be our, our thing. Give us a roll up, Andrew. What's, what's the FFRF's news? Um, <laughs> That was just fantastic. Uh, otherwise, my week has just been a week uh, busy as hell. I went to the Kansas City Oktoberfest this last weekend, which was all right. Um, finally replaced all of the terrible furniture in my living room, which is which is nice. So <laughs> finally yeah. replaced all that you had terrible. Dude, furniture. No, we literally our TV stand was two like cupboards without a top with like a laboratory bench stretched out between them and the TV set on top of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, like a college dorm room, but like a college dorm room. We were one step above a like telephone cable spool for a table kind of situation. <laughs> we, dude, my, my first apartment, the first apartment that I had on my own, I had a living girlfriend uh, so it wasn't just be just me, but mm-hmm. the first place that I moved after leaving my parents' home, um, we had an apartment, and I swear we had cinder blocks and mm-hmm. two by fours that we made a little TV stand out of. We used uh, yeah. like bed Bunny sheets ears. for window oh. coverings. Oh. Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, this is I. I am thirty three years old, and not for lack of trying. Right, this is the first time in my life that I bought a chair. That isn't like for a dining room table or like a computer office chair kind of thing. Like, <laughs> like just a lounging chair to sit and read in. <laughs> and most like, of the time the cats are in it. So <laughs> that makes me feel like an adult. I'm like, I've. Yeah, pretty much. It's weird. It's awesome. <laughs> and what's new with you, Mr. Duffy? Uh, not a whole lot. I mean, uh, just doing my my woodwork and trying to make some awards right now and i learned that uh the thickness of plexiglass in my laser makes a big difference <laughs> so there's some money that i'm going to have to salvage uh-huh uh but yeah i've been uh, i've been selling stuff like i actually had people calling me while i was at work like hey i i got a birthday party and i need a gift like well <laughs> why are you calling me <laughs> these are things i have made like like one person sarah met at the dog park and she liked all the stuff i was showing like the woodwork and stuff on my instagram mm-hmm. 
And she's like, yeah, I wanted to get my dad something for his birthday. What do you have available? It's mm-hmm. like, well, shit, not a lot. Like, so I had some of those, uh, those pots I made, uh, little lidded boxes I made on the lathe and she bought one of those and pen. And so I've been, I've been doing good. I've been selling stuff to outside of friends network lately. Yeah. So that's, that's always a plus. Well, that is good to, to breach that barrier <laughs> where, where to, to breach the Amway barrier. The yes. Amway Avon fucking. Oh man. <laughs> you, have you been listening Sensi. behind the bastards there, Dan? Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were talking about Amway recently on that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. I was like, that's an odd coincidence right there. No. <laughs> uh, Other than that, I hope I don't get stuck at work for long periods of time coming up here soon because uh, we, we just lost, well, we lost two guys, one indefinite and one for like a year oh, which yeah. has caused our shifts to be put into a tailspin one indefinite i'm guessing uh he had a botched surgery oh well, that's not at all what i was guessing so he went in for surgery uh ended up becoming septic oh jesus and had to have part of his intestines removed and he's on a colostomy bag right now so he's out six months to a year to indefinite right now. So we have no clue when he's going to be able to come back. Oh my God. That and sucks. Uh, since it was a surgery, it didn't happen at work. He doesn't get to get workman's comp. He doesn't get to get any of that stuff. So he's going to be relying on donated leave to even get paid. Damn. That's some bullshit. Yay, right America. Yeah. It's a good thing. We don't have like socialized medicine or anything like yeah. that. Yeah. Fuck. And he can't go on unemployment because he hasn't, quit or been fired mm, he's just gonna be ridiculous. on leave without pay mm. so that sucks man that's really fucked up yeah i like the guy and i got a ton of sick leave so i'll probably donate him a whole month at least yeah is there um is there any kind of like is he doing any sort of donation drive or anything like that not yet we don't even yeah. like i don't even know if you can even get out of bed right now right right if mm. anything like that happens we should see what we can do about that yeah i know i know there are some there's some federal firefighter organizations out there too that are kind of like hey when you got a dude that fell on hard times like this is a place you can go to to try to yeah is he a veteran at all i feel like the va should be able to help him too i can't remember if he was a vet or not i think Mm. he was we've only got like four guys in our department that never served yeah you should you should reach out to like va or but you know what? Hey, uh, Ted, if you're listening to this episode, uh, you should reach out to me and uh, <laughs> tell me if there's a veterans like organization that uh, that can advocate for this guy, please. Hmm. So, yeah. So as far as we know right now, he's got about two months worth of sick leave. And after that, he will no longer be getting paid. We that sucks. And we know he's going to be out for a minimum of six months. And he's only supposed to be gone for a month for surgery. He had the surgery, come back to work. End up getting going into sepsis, getting septic. You know, it's, he was eating himself because they. It's rough. It was it was a dirty surgery, I guess. Well, I hope that they Damn. sue the fuck out of that doctor too. Well, I guess they're pretty protected, I think. And that shit, you sign that paper saying, "I know the risks of this," and one of those is probably infection. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, Eesh, yikes! Well, that's yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, man. Well, uh, so, yeah, we have, I think we had four guys get directed for this week so far. Oh yeah. So yeah. So you're, so you're moving up that, moving up moving that, up that list quick. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Well, um, so I'm just really tired. Got a ton of work piling up on my plate. Also, uh, Tracy's grandmother is on death's door. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so that's been a uh, thing for the past shit at least week now <clears throat> and um they put her on morphine yesterday and they put her on haldol today or yesterday i can't remember and so she's on both of those and the hospice nurse increased both of them today tracy's over there right now sitting with her Mother and grandmother, her mother is, you know, living there providing care for Tracy's grandmother. And, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a really hard one on Tracy. It's her last living grandmother, last living grandparent at all. Um, and this, 
is her mother's mother who basically acted as a surrogate parent uh, for Tracy after her father died when she was only five. And so her grandparents really stepped up and, and helped raise Tracy and everything. And so it's going to be really hard. They're really close. One of the things that has come out of this that I, that I learned just before we started recording is one of the harms that come from religion relating to death and departing this world and then promises of an afterlife and, and heaven and hell. And, you know, in the Mormon tradition, there's no such thing as actual hell. There's outer darkness. And then there are three levels of heaven. All of that is fucking stupid, right? We, we know that that's just done. Like it's ridiculous bullshit, but the real harm that comes from that is that Tracy's mother was excommunicated from the LDS mm-hmm. church years and years and years ago. As part of that excommunication, her very, very devout mother, Tracy's grandmother, understands that Tracy's mom will never be able to get into the collab. Into, <laughs> will, will never be able to attain the the three heavens or the highest of the heavens in within the LDS church. So what happened today is, you know, Tracy's over there, her grandmother's in and out. She's, she's in a morphine brain fog. She's, you know, when the, she's basically seeing dead relatives and shit. So, mm-hmm. so they, she, she got up, she wanted to go to the bathroom and she, Tracy's mom is helping her and Tracy is in the other room that finishes up. Tracy's mom comes out of the bathroom, just bawling her eyes out and tells Tracy that her grandmother told her in a conspiratorial tone that when I get out of here, I'm going to sneak you in with me. And that her mom was just bawling her eyes out. And I'm like, I, I must be missing some, some context here because I didn't quite understand. And Everybody in the audience probably knows where I'm going with this because I have of the preface that I gave to this little story that uh, Tracy's reply was, I'm guessing grandma is referring to heaven. She's going to sneak my mom into heaven with her because mom's obviously not going to heaven because excommunication. So Tracy's grandmother in her last moments on earth is fretting about the idea that she won't have her daughter who has been caring her for her for years, be able to join her in heaven because of these ridiculous promises that she's been made. And then the fear that is also a part of that, that tells her that her daughter will not be able to join her. The daughter who has cared for her and taken care of her mm-hmm. for years won't be able to get into heaven because she did something that a church leader didn't like. And that's fucking awful, man. Like that's that's mm-hmm. so mentally and emotionally abusive for everybody involved. Her, like her grandmother is in and out of consciousness, barely able to speak, can hardly move, and that's one of her, the her biggest fears right now is that she's not going to see her daughter in this imagined afterlife. Yeah. And she's going to yeah. die with those thoughts because of this fucking ridiculous abusive terrible teaching within the lds faith and the lds faith isn't alone in these types of things in these types of teachings that offer a separation from family members in an in an afterlife that nobody has any evidence for it's just one of those things that is like oh great so we we know how terrible religion can be the whole religious piece of this is really bothering me a whole lot it's just messy and fucked up. I mean, it reminds me of the story of the uh, young kid who committed suicide so they can go see their dad in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of awful bullshit that is used by religions to manipulate people emotionally. Yeah. I just don't like it at all. Yeah. Well, and like that French, uh, the French Catholics, right, who have now been discovered to have raped you know, 300,000 oh. kids or something like uh-huh. that. Yeah, something like an average of 110 kids per person. Yeah. And and I was listening to whoever it was that was filling in for Rachel Maddow on uh, on the MSNBC. Ari Milbert. And he, yeah. Okay. I don't watch MSNBC. But oh, no, wait. For Rachel. Sorry. It was Ali Velshi. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Um, because Ari Melber is the one who has all the rap, <laughs> all the rap. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I only know of him from John Oliver's segments, <laughs> making fun of him. Um, so anyway, the guy filling in was talking to somebody about that. Or am I thinking of the daily? I don't know. I don't care. It's not worth my time. Anyway, I was listening to somebody covering that news, but it was mainstream. You know, it wasn't like a, like an atheist podcast covering it. Right. Mm-hmm. And the guy said, after all of these revelations, uh, I feel like, like I shouldn't be surprised. Like I'm not surprised that yet another sex scandal came out of the Catholic church. I guess I'm surprised that so many of these have happened and there are still huge, massive child sex assault scandals coming out of the Catholic church now. Like they just keep coming. They don't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, like, it's, it's wild to hear that coming out of a, you know, millions of listeners kind of show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm yeah. not surprised. I'm surprised. Religion is just follow the faith. Yeah. It's the worst. Like that's, I'm, I'm glad that that's why we have this show, you know, like that's, I'm glad that people are leaving religion because no organization should exist that can use the threat of eternal damnation or not being able to spend time with your family in the afterlife as ways of browbeating people into covering up things like child sex abuse Mm -hmm. or, you know, lesser crimes like embezzlement and, you know, government control. Like, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And locking you into this cycle of emotional and mental abuse that you're concerned mm-hmm. about it up until your dying day when you will hopefully be released from this earthly prison. Mm-hmm. Or, or abuse oh. like I suffered, you know, where my parents were, you know, keeping me in a, a position of continual punishment my entire teen years because they were worried, terrified that I would do something that would somehow threaten my eternal salvation mm-hmm. you know yeah well I, th- I think it's a good thing we're talking about this because we're kind of going to be talking about religion punishing people anyways this episode oh fantastic <laughs> yeah i'm yeah. sorry ryan we uh <laughs> oh no and that was that was good i was I, see, I could hear dan kept putting i was the key words i was there. building like, <laughs> toward a segue there yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah ryan has uh prepared a bunch of information for us that we'll be talking about on the other side of this little break Hey everybody, it's X from the Utah Outcasts podcast and YouTube channel, and you're listening to The Godless Revolution. I think it's getting a little too risky keeping you up here. Yeah, you know what's risky? Letting your son go on that church thing. Well, her name's Ann, Dad, and he's not going on her. Okay, they're just friends. Thank you to everybody who has rated the show on iTunes and Stitcher and are following us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. And to all our Patreon patrons, you make the show possible. All right, so uh, today we decided to talk about the prison system a little bit, and I uh, I kind of wanted to delve into the religious influence of prisons a bit because that's what we that's what we do. Ooh wee! First, uh, I wanted to go over some staggering numbers. Some staggering I, numbers. Okay, yeah, and I got these from uh, the sen- sentencingproject.org. dot uh. org. Uh, according to them, the prison population has nearly quadrupled since nineteen eighty four. Quintupled, what? even quintupled. I am already fucking up my words. I'm going to put the disclaimer out right now. There are some names in here. I'm going to fuck them up. <laughs> People used to have some weird names. Uh huh. Yeah. They used to. They still do, man. They yeah, they they do, especially here in Utah. Oh yeah. But uh, one in seven people in prison are serving either a life sentence, life with parole, life without parole, or virtual life, which is 50 years or more. Mm-hmm. One in seven? One in seven. Wow. That's, uh, wait till I get to the numbers a little further down and you'll be even more disturbed. At the federal level, people incarcerated on drug convictions make up nearly half, half of the prison population. At the state level, the number of people in prison for drug offenses has increased ninefold since 1980. Although it has begun to decline in recent years, most are not high level actors in the drug trade. And most have no prior criminal record for violent offenses. So this is this is the the war on drugs has led to a failing explosive increase in incarcerated Americans. And they're not like you said, they're not 
high level criminals. They're no. probably street dealers, people who it, get caught with more than they're supposed exactly. to have or something. Yeah. Like the, the article that I was talking about this also talked about how these people that are being arrested and put to jail are people that are so easily replaceable on the streets that it doesn't even affect the drug trade. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just opens up an opportunity for somebody it else to move into that exactly. slot. Yeah. Jobs open. Yeah. Corner but, of fifth and main. Ryan, what, what color are those people though? Well, these next numbers might point to that a little bit. Cause this is kind of disturbing. Mm. Okay. So the lifetime likelihood of imprisonment for a U.S. resident born in 2001. White men, one in 17. White Jesus, women, that's one a, in 111. That's still a big number. One in 17 people mm. will be imprisoned. White men. Well, yeah. <laughs> So, but then we got Latin men, Latinx men is one in six. Oh my God. Latinx women, one in 45. Dude. It, uh, the, now the, I know you're holding your breath here. Wait a minute. The, these are people who are born after 2001. Born in the, the year of 2001. The likelihood of being born in 2001. They just took that year's data and said the likelihood. So even, yeah, going after that, those numbers probably don't change a whole lot going year to year. Wow. But that was the year that they were using as their data point. Wow. 2001. Wow. Um, black men. One in three. Holy shit. What? Black women. One in 18. One in three, three. black men born in 2001 will one. be imprisoned. That's their likelihood of being imprisoned. Wow. Holy uh, shit, dude. Yeah. So how do we end up with two point over? 2.2 million people in prison. And why is the U.S. the only developed nation that still has the death penalty? And why does our system focus more on confinement and less on rehabilitation education? Well, I'm, I'm going to take us on a little bit of a history tour. <laughs> I like First, the hand motions that nobody else can see. <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm juggling watermelons. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I originally was doing this, I didn't go this far back to start with. But when I had read this, I was like, this is fucking interesting. I'm going to put it in there uh -huh. because in my mind, America basically started as a prison colony or as a prison in the 1600s. Uh, America uh, was I, I'm, like I knew or I I'd knew heard, about Australia. Yeah, about yeah. Australia. Yeah. Yeah. I knew that. I didn't know this or to the level it was going on here or what they were fucking doing. But but Ryan Dinesh D'Souza says that it was people looking for religious freedom. <laughs> um, not according to this at all. Huh. Um, yeah, according to social historian Mary uh, Marie Gottschalk, Gottschalk. Yeah, she got chalk. <laughs> um, convicts were indispensable to English settlement efforts in what is now the United States in the late 16th century. Richard. Hoculut, I told you I'm going to fuck these names up. Uh, he called for large scale conscription of criminals to settle the new world for England. But official action from Hoculut's proposal lagged until 1606 when English crown escalated his colonization efforts. Sir John Popham's uh, colonial ventures in present day Maine uh, was stocked. A contemporary critic complained out of all the jails of England. Oh, wow. Uh, the Virginia Company, the corporate entity responsible for settling Jamestown, authorized its colonies to seize Native American children wherever they could for conversation to or conversion to the knowledge and worship of the true God in their Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Oh, not like those Later other on, Mormons people. would do the same thing with their residential schools. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Uh, the colonists themselves, in effect, uh, lived as prisoners of the company's uh, governor and his agents. Uh, men caught trying to escape or tortured to death. Uh, seamstresses who erred in their sewing were subject to whippings. And one from Richard Barnes, uh, according, uh, accused of uttering uh, based and detracting words based on uh, against the governor, was ordered to be disarmed and have his arms broken. And his tongue bored through with an awl Ugh. before being banished from the settlement entirely. Jesus. When control of the Virginia Company passed to Sir Edward Sandy in 1618, 
efforts began to bring large number of settlers to New England against their will. So basically they, had, they changed some laws. Statutes began to provide for uh, penal transportation to the American colonies as an alternative to corporal punishment in this period. Uh, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. At the same time, the legal definition of vagrancy was greatly expanded. Vagrancy. So are are they, are they talking about like... Uh, th- petty laws. Okay. Uh, no, no, no. Specifically, it's, vagrancy is is like the crime of being unemployed. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, which was a historical problem. It was It was a holdover from like when serfdom ended, like, I mean, it was holdover from when serfdom was a thing, mm-hmm. but it used to be the case that like, if you lived on the Lord's land, like you would pay a tribute to that Lord. And if you didn't have work, they would find work for you breaking rocks. Right. And when the, the bubonic plague went through and the Renaissance did its whole thing and like serfdom kind of more or less went away um, in order to retain the ability of forcing people to do labor for, you know, whoever ran the land in their vicinity, they made vagrancy crimes um, associated with being homeless and or out of work in that area. Mm. So uh, Royal Commission endorsed the uh, notion that any felon except those convicted of murder, witchcraft, burglary or rape could legally be transported to Virginia or the West Indies to work as a uh, plantation servant. Sandy also pro- proposed sending maids to Jamestown as breeders. Mm. So handmaids kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, their their costs of passage could be paid uh, for by the planters uh, who took them in as wives. So basically it's uh, an early form of... Uh, what do you call that? A uh, mail order bride, except it's a, would it be a ship ordered bride? Oh, wow. Yeah. So over 60 such women had uh, made the passage of Virginia and more followed. King James the first Royal administration also sent vagrant children to the new world as servants. A letter in the Virginia company's records suggests that as many as 1500 children were sent to Virginia between 1619 and 1627. Also, By 1619, African-American prisoners were brought to Jamestown and sold as slaves as well, making England's entry into the Atlantic slave trade. Mm. But the reason why I think this is important, because they brought a lot of that to America, the way we imprisoned, we did stuff. It was basically like the one guy having his arms broken and basically being tortured. Mm. That's kind of the way our system ran for a long time here. Uh, You know, stockades, taking all the old ways we punished people in England was being brought to America. Mm-hmm. Now, prisons are an ancient concept, but there is a difference between a jail and a prison. So throughout history, what most people would call a prison functioned more like a jail. In early America, this meant dozens of people crammed into a room until some other sort of punishment, often some type of public humiliation, bodily pain, mutilation, or execution could be afflicted. So here comes in our friends. I don't think we've talked about these guys much at all ever on this podcast. This is the Philadelphia Society for Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisoners. Way too long of a society. PSAMP. I was trying to think of a funny way to make an acronym for it, but I, <laughs> I, I gave up. PSAMP PP. So this was a group of Christians and mostly Quaker reformers. These idealists saw the continued use of corporal punishment as Proof of the feeble operation of reason and religion, which I don't really know how those two go together. Mm. Can you say that uh, again? They, they said it was proof of the feeble operation of reason and religion. Okay. So I think what they're pointing at, Quakers tend to be the good guys in American history. And I think they, what they're pointing out is that like no reasonable person and no person in like the no true Scotsman kind of way, no true Christian mm-hmm can treat people this poorly in mm-hmm. accordance with reason and so-called religious belief. Mm-hmm. It's probably what they're getting after. Yeah. yeah that rather than, think- rather than just penalizing people, we should seek to reform them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which they yeah. have tried to do. And I actually will say it right off the bat. They still, to this day are one of the few religious groups I can see out there. They're actually fighting against the death penalty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Quakers and I'll always mention this are the, yeah. Um, uh, the sponsors of the American Humanist Association and the yeah. reason why it's legally treated as a religious parsonage. Hmm. 
So I give them credit. And actually a lot of this information I got was through Quaker websites. Like mm-hmm. they don't hold back on saying, yeah, this is, we, this didn't work the way we wanted it to. And this is what happened. Yeah. So they, they aren't hiding it. Yeah. If, if fascism does come to America, I will be converting to Quaker like on air <laughs> <laughs> so that I can have a Christian religion of record. Like, yeah. Openly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, but so their, their founder, ben, Benjamin Rush wrote in eight, uh, 1787 that they were not against punishment altogether. I only wish only to change the place and manner of inflicting the inflicting them uh, so as to render them effectual for the reformation of criminals and beneficial to society, wrote Mr. Rush. Mm. So they weren't against punishment. They just wanted it done in a different way. They were I just to reform punishment. Yeah. Yeah. We need to make sure that if we're, you know, breaking people's arms, that they understand that it's out of love and that they should change yeah. their ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think, yeah, he didn't really go away from that. It was pretty much, he just, just don't kill him. Yeah. I think it's what they were trying to get at. So well, like, early- I, I, what, what possible purpose could, uh, piercing someone's tongue with an all serve? Uh, <laughs> he know? can't tell how bad his punishment was. Can't, yeah, well, can't talk well, shit well, about well, the governor anymore. Well, well, well. Right? Yeah. Can't talk shit about the governor well. anymore. Yeah. yeah. So in the early 1800s, a French historian made a visit to the United States, not to see how the new nation was doing, but to check on its prisons. Instead of putting a person to death or chopping off a body part, uh, we would just lock them in solitary confinement. Uh, This way they could repent and restore the soul. I'm going to fuck his name up. De Tocqueville. French De 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 Tocqueville. Mm -hmm. Alexis De Tocqueville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, it's like Tocqueville. It sounds like a place you'd go on 420. <laughs> <laughs> well, the French historian de Tocqueville and his colleague uh, Gustave de Baumont in their report on American penitentiary said, yet too much solitude leaves a prisoner prayer, leaves a prisoner prey to the remor- uh, remorses of his soul. And the terrors of his imagination. So prisoners would be assigned labor that fatigued the body and relieves the soul. Yeah, if we work the shit out of these people, they're not going to have much energy to be assholes. And that was pretty much what they were doing. Wild. Mm. So we stopped killing them. Now we just started torturing them. Yay. Uh, Let's do some improvements. Baby steps. But it was also around this time that we made some very famous prisons. Uh, one that you ghost hunters will know very well. The Eastern State Penitentiary. Mm-hmm. Oh, spooky. <laughs> and the Auburn Prison in upstate New York. <laughs> Let the avenue to this house be rendered difficult and gloomy by mountains of morose, wrote Quaker reformer Benjamin Rush of his vision of the penitentiary in 1787. Let the doors be of iron. Let the uh, uh, grating occasionally be opened and shutting them uh, be increased by an echo that shall deeply pierce the soul. Mm. Each inmate was confined in a tiny cell with only a Bible to read isolated from human contact. Yeah, that sounds lovely. Uh huh. I mean, they got better with Benjamin Uh Franklin. (laughs) Well, it just became a smaller Bible. (laughs) So in at this time, so the prison had a recognizable, Panopticon design featuring a central observatory tower from which spokes of housing isolation cells radiated out, uh, becoming a model for hundreds of other prisons. The idealism of getting rid of corporal punishment quickly faded when the cost of these new systems became too taxing, but the use of confinement and hard labor stuck. Mm. So essentially we decided it's, it's, uh, it's cheaper to kill them. And it is just to keep them confined. Hmm. That's kind of fucked up. Uh-huh. Yeah. <sighs> Devising this alternative, explained Andrew Scott Nicky, a professor of religious studies at the Manhattan College in New York City. The early, the early prison reformers drew on the uh, Masonic practice of confining a wayward monk to his cell, supplying him with work and letting him heal so that he might be returned to the community. Yet the rule of St. Benedict 
makes clear Mr. Scott, Scott, uh, Scott Nicky said, I can just call him Scott. <laughs> <laughs> he said that this practice was only to be used when conflict res- resolution processes outlined in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him, had failed. Uh, when confinement was necessary, abbots were instructed to send in older, wiser monks to counsel the offending brother, lest he be swallowed up by overmuch sorrow. Inmates, uh, they're supposed to imitate the loving kindness of the good shepherd, urged by St. Benedict, uh, find the one that was gone astray and gently carry him back to the flock. Hmm. But still, you're, I don't see how locking a person up in a cell Zero contact with humans is going to help anybody. And yet that was, that was kind of their belief at that time. Isolation, read the Bible, clean your soul, get cleansed, and you can return to society. My name is Mandisa Thomas, and I am the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated here in Atlanta, Georgia. You may find us at blacknonbelievers.org. You can also find me on Patreon at patreon.com backslash Mandisa Latifa, and you are listening to The Godless Revolution. George Michael, I don't think you should be going on this promised land thing. What? Why, is this because I missed school? No. You didn't miss school for that? And that's when Maybe decided to become a devout Christian. Do you guys know where I could get one of those gold necklaces with a T on it? That's a cross. A cross from where? If you have questions, comments, concerns, compliments, corrections, criticisms, or concepts for content, contact the show via email at godlessrevolution at gmail.com, by text or voicemail at 330-81-REBEL, or Twitter the twatter at TGR Podcast. Thank you! So we've gone over some stuff that used to happen in prisons, but surely things are so much better now, right? Um, no. (laughs) Damn it! Damn it! Well, shit. It's it's really not. So I, I'm going to continue a little bit more here with uh, Mr. Uh, Scott, Nikki. Uh, we basically said that the, the, the ideology of confinement as it developed in church history never intended punishment as an end in itself. Uh, and he wrote this in a 2015 roundtable paper at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. He also goes on to say, but as a means to employ solitude and silence aided by attentive mentors as the motivation for the detention of person to recognize their natural sociability and capability for care and transcendence. But with this ideology may have inspired uh, early this, this inspired the early American reformers. It is nowhere present in us prison systems. Uh, says Mr. Scott Nicky absent loving kindness and community restoration. We're left now with a massive system, these gulags of jails and prisons, administering pain and punishment. And for the most part, you can't get one coherent explanation anywhere. And I read this stuff for a living. We really hmm. don't even know why we're doing it. And that was all Scott Nicky saying, this is like, what we're doing, f- but why? Why? <laughs> like right. it, It's serving no purpose. It doesn't fucking work. The only thing it does is cost a lot of money and prepare people to be pre- better criminals when they're eventually released. Yeah. Wow. So a lot of us think, we, I think we all kind of say the whole thing sometimes, well, atheists are only 0.5 or 0.05% of the prison population. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've heard that line several times. Uh, but religion really wasn't allowed in prison, uh, except for a certain breed of religion. And uh, you can guess what was allowed. So people could be locked away, but they were not allowed to practice the religion they wanted to practice. Okay, so they so they had did they, so they had to practice a religion, but they couldn't. They did, pick what they didn't religion have to, they but if to they be. wanted to practice religion, it had to be the Christian religion. Yeah. Uh. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have true religious freedom inside prison. How that I don't. How could they even make them not like have well, whatever religion they want? You know what I mean? Like that's where we get 1964 Cooper V uh, Pate. Okay. 
In this case, a prisoner was denied access to the Quran while other religions were allowed access to their religious texts. Mm. He ended up winning this case on the grounds that the Bill of Rights exists in prison just like it does on the outside. So mm-hmm. nowadays, the Muslim religion is the largest growing re- religion inside a prison. And I kind of talked about this last week, not on the show, but just between us, we're kind of like, well, why is that? Mm-hmm. Why is the Muslim religion the largest one? We know there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of imams, there are a lot of all that kind of stuff in there, but I couldn't find any solid answer to that. So I kind of was going along here with a correlation possibly being causation. So I could be incredibly wrong, but uh, I'd seen some, watched some videos and seen some stuff on it. And in interviews, some inmates uh, credited Malcolm X as being their influence to wanting to be Muslim. And the others actually cited this court case Mm -hmm. because this court case beat the government. Mm -hmm. So it showed strength. Like you're in there. You want to do something against the man. Mm -hmm. Hey, the Muslim faith beat the man and got us in, you know, our religion in prison. So yeah, they're strong. It's like a show of strength to join that group. And it is also kind of, you know, gang clicks a little bit, Hmm. but uh, one, one of the guys that converted to to, uh, the Muslim faith in there didn't know. He goes, this isn't like the other groups. Like you got the Aryans, the Mexicans, all the other gangs. If a white guy wants to join in with us, he's in with us. He's protected. He is a Muslim brother. Mm-hmm. So it kind of rolls that way a little bit too. Hmm. But uh, I didn't know this about Rifra. Rifra was also a big push to get religious freedom inside of prisons. Even though they won this court case, it wasn't until Rifra was passed that they had true religious freedom inside uh, prison. And uh, here's a line from one of our favorite people. Senator Orrin Hatch. We want religion in prisons, declared Senator Orrin Hatch, one of the original sponsors of RIFRA. It is one of the best rehabilitative influences we can have. Just because there are prisoners does not mean all of their rights should go down the drain. Oh wow. So I'm so you said that Muslims are the are the fastest growing religion. Okay, so, so it so it's not the largest percentage it, overall. Correct. They have the, they're, um, I think when I looked at it, they're around 18% of the prison population is Muslim, but they have the fastest growth. Well, so I'm looking at, I'm looking at an article from 538, and this is from 2015. And it's interesting. It it gives a a breakdown of uh, various religious sects, what Mm -hmm. population they make up in the prison population, and then what population they make up just in general. So it's got their mm-hmm. prison population percentage and then a general general population percentage. It's interesting. The, the top number is for Protestants who mm. are 28.7% of the prison population, but 44% of the general population. The next largest uh, religious sect is Catholicism. And in prison, they're represented by 24% of the prison population in the general population. It's 25. So that's really close. Like, yeah. like yeah. if you're Catholic, your odds of being in prison <laughs> versus general population are about the same. Uh, but for Muslims, it's interesting. This says 8.4% prison population, but only 0.6% of the general population. So that's wildly out of, out of, yeah. Work. Yeah. Right. Interesting. And then it goes down and it breaks them all out, but none of the others even even come to come close. amount to more than five percent. Yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of wild. Hmm. And uh, I, f- I found this interesting too. So I, I previously talked about you now people get protection uh, while they're in prison from their you know whatever religious group they're in is because it kind of operates like a gang almost sometimes. Their religious and gang, it, yeah, yeah. And I also thought it was kind of funny that. Uh, some of them were talking. One guy said he never professed a religion in jail, but he was more spiritual, but he didn't like go like, no, I never, you know, took part in most of it. And he said, the reason why he goes, you know, you got this guy coming down the hall, you know, with his bead on his cross proclaiming he's, you know, so holy and better than you. And then he goes into a cell, shoots up some drugs and sucks someone's dick. 
Oui. <laughs> she's like, ah. She's like, so some people look at people in prison as basically pulling more of a con game with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, the chapel spaces and the prayer rooms are safe spaces in prison. Meaning they don't get monitored as much as the rest of the prison. Ah. So a lot of people were talking about the fact that, yeah, like if you got guys that want to do business, not like do business, like beat the shit out of someone, but, you know, talk about stuff away from the guards ears, they would go do it in chapel. If or if you got some contraband, you want to move between parts of the cell. Yeah, you go do it in if, chapel. If they're selling right. drugs, if they're planning yeah. any kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they would, a lot of guys would actually use the chapel and the prayer rooms to do a lot of illicit activities because it was less monitored by prison staff Mm -hmm. and you couldn't deny them access to it under RIFRA Mm. under RIFRA. Even if you're in solitary confinement, they have to grant you permission to either meet with a religious leader or attend religious services. Kind of, kind of breaks down the argument that like believing in a deity will, uh, and, and believing that you're being observed by that deity will cause you to like change your actions right for the better because yeah. don't Christians say that a lot like oh well if you believe there's a God that'll stop you from doing bad things and here they are using their God's chapel as a means of of dealing right. drugs and shit mm-hmm. because they know it's a as they called it a safe space a hmm. safe space to deal drugs <laughs> well. so but there is the common belief that inmates practice religion while in prison because uh, they need to find religion uh, for multiple purposes, or it's a con game. This believes that inmates hope mm-hmm. prison administrators and parole authorities will view their religious practice as an attempt to become more moral, pro-social, and law-abiding citizens. Uh, the result will be earlier res- release. And for decades, the correctional literature and popular media had cultivated this belief. So correctional officers often support the religion for prayer early or the religion for early parole viewpoint. They base their impressions on a personal experience or witnessing inmates who have professed to be religious, but who have then acted to the contrary or who are repeat visitors to the institution. Mm -hmm. Also, correctional officers support this view because they are influenced by their own subculture. The subculture, as with other cultures, possesses certain beliefs that are accepted as truth and passed among the officers. The belief about inmates finding religion for early parole has been transmitted through generations of correctional inmates, officers, and staff. You would think yeah. that they would be wise to that game by now. But they're not because it's it's the same thing. Like when you could be a, a horrible person and you read their obituary, they were such a good Christian. They were a good man. It's like, They've been saved. They've been born yeah. again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Mm. If you if if it works so well, we won't have so many repeat offenders entering the prison system. Yeah, the recidivism rates here in the United States are fucking ridiculous. Like, yeah. it's a clear indication that having these penal systems in place as they exist now really don't do much don't to deter work. crime. If anything, it just prepares people on the inside to be better criminals when they get out again. Yes. And I had actually read an article talking about that, how some people, you go into prison for a low level crime and you come out with a degree in criminology or criminaling. (laughs) I don't know how you want to pronounce it. Not criminology. Yeah. You're, you're now a criminal. You Uh now learn the streets. You learn the stuff you got, you got into some connections and now you go out and do worse stuff than you were before. My name is now Dr. Crimey crime. But Orrin Hatch says it's one of the best rehabilitative influencers we can have. Orrin Hatch. There's a name I've not heard for a while, <laughs> thankfully. Oof. But yeah, uh, yeah. Our, our prison system was shaped by religion and it's been fucked up by religion. And we don't do the same kind of stuff that we do in other countries where it's actual rehabilitation. We're there. It's a, it's a, it's a punitive system. You're there being punished. Uh, get yeah. right with God or well, it's, the fuck there. it's, it's, it's always seemed really strange to me that people who profess to have a religious belief in God and in an afterlife and in God as the 
ultimate judge of a person's life when put on the scales of justice that in the end justice will be meted out by their God that they worship. Right. So it's always seemed really weird for me that those same religious people either are criminals themselves here or that they decide that in order to punish these people, we should lock them up, beat them, torture them, whatever the case may be. When really, if they think that their God is so powerful, will protect everybody and then will ultimately meet out the punishment deserved by these criminals, then what the fuck are they doing interfering with God's plan and all of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, mm. if, in, if in the early days of prison, when we locked them in solitary confinement with nothing but a Bible, if that was, wasn't working and you had to force them to do forced labor in order to break them down even further, obviously the Bible thing wasn't fucking working. Well, so, yeah. and, and like, there's, there's a history major or a humanities major who can do a better job of, of conveying what I'm about to say. But um, when Sandra was prepping for her political science masters and when I was doing some prep and applying for a political science masters, um, we went through and we we watched a very long, very in depth, um, like Renaissance or, or basically European history course, right? Um, and one of the important things about European history is uh, like capital N, capital O, natural order, mm-hmm. right? This theory that people had of the time that there was a no shit natural order that went from like God, angels, saints. Like- um like king. religious leaders and kings and then lords and then everybody else right mm-hmm. and and really everybody else who was male and then everybody else who was women and then people who weren't white right mm. <laughs> was really how that went right mm. um and taking that idea you know for for them if you were in your given cast right you were part of what was called the great chain and every link in the chain had its purpose, right? And and the people who were at those bottom levels of the of the natural order, their job was to work for the person who was in the chain above them, right? And so if a person failed to do what was, you know, their duty in the natural order, um, then they needed to be made to conform to that natural order. And and in terms of like why is it that the religious people or, or the nobility, right, or whatever form of political leadership as times changed at the top didn't, uh, you know, didn't themselves follow laws? Um, I like to point to uh, something written by Frank Willihot, Um And he argued conservatism consists of exactly one proposition to wit. There must be in groups whom the law protects but does not bind alongside out groups whom the law binds but does not protect. Now, think about if you're a Catholic priest or a, you know, King Louis the 14th, right? You you can rape and murder anyone that you want. Oh, yeah. And there is no law that will bind you from that. But the law will protect you from anyone trying to harm you or rob you. Now imagine that you're George Floyd, right? The law binds you from unknowingly passing a $20 bill that turned out to be counterfeit, uh, but it does not protect you in the way that it should in terms of the lawful force used against you, Mm -hmm. right? And that's, Mm -hmm. I think taking those two ideas together is how we can rectify how it is that people on top are such hypocrites in terms of their treatment on the bottom mm-hmm. or of those on the bottom. Mm-hmm. Which I, which I think will be something we'll have to be revisiting and might get back more into prison system stuff when we talk about redlining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I also want to talk about the 13th amendment sometime, but the bigger thing um, is, is I've been reconsidering that quote, you know, as it describes conservatism. Um, and, and that quote is used a lot online. But the funny thing is that Frank Willahot, when he wrote that line, he wrote it in a book called The Travesty of Liberalism, and he argued that there is only conservatism. No other political philosophy actually exists. By political analog of Graham's law, conservatism has driven every other idea out of circulation. Um, that there should be anti-conservatism, but it doesn't exist yet. And what he was arguing there is that conservatism needs to be viewed as those who are in power 
uh, maintaining power and those who do not have power seizing power. And so as soon as somebody who was previously an underdog acquires power, they immediately swing into place in an attempt to maintain that power. And in so doing, they themselves now follow that one law of conservatism to protect some and and bind others, right? Mm-hmm. So that's something I want to give some thought to as well. Um, looking at like groups as they change society, but then immediately freeze their own stats and prevent future change from taking place. People like Christian Cinema, right, who make their way to the top and then pull up the ladder behind them. Mm-hmm. So oh, oh, I, I think we've got like dollar. two to three episodes that, that can potentially spawn off of this one mm. going forward. Well, cool, cool. Thanks for putting this together, Ryan. I appreciate yeah, it. I hope, I hope it was a uh, cohesive and a little educational at least. Yeah. 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 I, I did not, I knew that there was religious involvement in terms of prison treatment, but I didn't realize the systemic nature of like shipping prisoners to the new world. As, and I didn't, I didn't know that either until I was reading into like, I was trying to finally just look up like, Hey, you know, mm-hmm. early, early prison systems in the U S like what, like they would do mm-hmm. in like Jamestown and all the original settlements yeah. and stuff like how they ran it. And that's where I came across. And I was like, Oh shit. Like yep. literally Jamestown was a prison. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and I do remember that, like I had to remember that the Quakers were pretty instrumental in kind of proposing the idea that, Hey, maybe prison should be reformation. Yeah. rather than just punishment and that they were still fucking awful, but that they were like, Hey, you know, what if we did this as like uh try to make people better rather than destroy them. So that, that's still a big push. I, I found one whole article about um, a Quaker youth group mm-hmm. that still pushes like it's really influential. It goes to uh, like the mm-hmm. Senate and stuff and tries to push to get true reformation in prisons yeah. to where it's like, no, we want, we want to get rid of the pu- punitive Mm-hmm. stuff and be more rehabilitation yeah. well and so. it's 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 cool to see that they've gone from uh um why can't i think of his name uh benjamin rush you know in his day which was still like, quite like savage, we need to punish him but we just don't kill yeah. him right uh to, to what they are today like they've shown the ability to actually progress which is limited in in religious yeah. groups so i mean at his time in in the 1600s religion probably was the only way they thought you could reform yourself mm-hmm which yeah. is wrong. <laughs> right. But, right. But that but was operating within his only, paradigm, right? That's religion Thomas was the only way to get yeah. re- to reform a person. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to shove religion yeah. down their throat until they reform. Mm. Yeah. Well, fun, fun. Um, we have run out of time for this episode. We will, we'll think about talking about all this other stuff in future episodes. That would be fun. Before we go, I want to make sure that we thank our Patreon supporters. That would be two skeptical chaps. Alan Firth. Don't be a Richard. Hunter Grin. John McCullough. Ollie Olson. Sinead Duffy. Steve Kuno. Stephen Andrus. Tiffany Hudson. Vanessa. All hail Peanut Buttra. Corey Ebert. Jeff Peterson. Jeremy Goodson. Matthew Sanders. Megan Mitchell. That guy that asked questions before he finishes the show. Alex Jones's Gay Frog Brigade. Utah Outcasts. Wesley Aaron. Freethinker215. Janet Uter. Purple Dragon. Sarah Segovia. Savita Kuna. Theodore Sellen. Tim Jacobson. Trisha Weir. A noble spirit embiggens the smallest man. A perfectly cromulent statement. By the way, I came here to lead, not to read. So, uh... Whoever that is, give us a new tongue twister. (laughs) Come at me, bro. And Uh, James, thank you all very, very much for your contributions to the show. We really appreciate it. If you would like to become a Patreon supporter, you can do so easily by going to patreon.com slash godless revolution, where you can pledge as little as $1 per episode for fun things like extended editions, early releases of episodes, bonus episodes, extended outtakes, clips from the cutting room floor, all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, in the last episode we did, there were some <laughs> extended outtakes uh, of Andrew that I put in there for for our listeners that, that I obtained while we were going through our pre-recording questions and stuff and warming up. So that was fun. 
Uh, yeah. And one last thing uh, before we sign off, I will be going to the FFRF uh, convention in Boston. That's going to be the 19th through 21st of brain fart November. November yeah. Um, you should sign up. Uh, you should go. If you live nearby and you're a student, they've got like a student rate. Um, but yeah, try and make it out there. Uh, if you do hit me up, uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So, yeah, it looks like it'll be a lot of fun. I think that you'll have a fantastic time for sure. Yeah. What's, uh, all for me. I'm really tired and I need to go back to work. So Mm. uh, thanks everybody's. I'm going to fuck off and eat pizza. I think I'm going to finally finish the Avengers like pseudo marathon I've been on. I think I've got end game up next. So. Oh, cool. That's fun. Yeah. All right. Fun. Fun. Chat with you guys next week. See ya. Everyone can see me waving. <laughs> <laughs> There's undo for a reason. It's, and it's to yeah. undo things when you fuck them up. God's forgiveness is like the control Z of our lives. So I'm sorry for hanging up on you guys abruptly. I must have mistaken a, uh, a comma oh. for a period last week. Like, all right, cool, we're done, deuces. Based on their uh, will, based uh, against their will, uh, a long tide, uh, I'm fucking this up. <laughs> a new world against their will gain traction against uh, less uh, coercive, met- co- yeah, co- and I'm fucking up. <laughs> Just leave it in. Just leave it in. Cool beans. All right. I'm Thanks, out. guys. For right. real this time. Don't right. act like I hung up and surprised you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.